Do you like conversation on a variety of topics? Feel like no one wants to talk about the things that interest you? Tired of only hearing the same political, sports, or catastrophe talk? Yeah, we feel that way too. Join two high-functioning geeks as they discuss just about anything under the sun. We can't tell you what we'll be talking about each week because we don't know where our brains will take us. It will be an interesting conversation, though, so hang on and join us. Here comes the Relentless Geekery. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> a good thing to have on our checklist when we start these sessions. We yeah. lost a good, a good chat at the start last time, but I think we included it somehow as we went on. But, uh, yeah, we gave an overview, a summary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so here's what we kind of talked about. All right, moving on. <laughs> Let me pull up some notes for today. We have a couple things. So uh, the weekend, the RG, let, let me recap that real quick for you. Sure. Um, it was okay. Uh, there weren't quite as many people as I'm used to in Cincinnati. Uh, okay. And I think a couple of the people running it were new. So, you know, there were okay. some bumps and stuff. Uh, of course, you had some people just sitting around bitching. It's like, okay, I am not even talking to you people, you know, whatever. Yeah. It, it's, again, as you know, that's a, a sad thing in Mensa or any volunteer organization, just yeah. how much the people who are not doing anything are willing to talk about how it should be done. Right. You know what I mean? There's, there's this, it's, it's very tough to stay a happy involved volunteer when 80% of the feedback you get is how you somehow screwed up. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know how funny. rough those things are to plan and execute and the, the logistics of doing that stuff. Exactly. Uh, Jason had a fantastic weekend. I mean, uh, Saturday, Sunday morning, Gina texted him at 3.30. He's like, hey, uh, you coming back to the room and going to bed? He's like, I'm still playing cards. So very good. Yeah, that, that's all. You know, I'm getting a little old to stay till dawn. But that was one of some of our favorite RG memories is you're goofing off with friends. You don't want it to stop. So right. you don't. You play until three, four, five in the morning. And then you're like, well, I had a program I really want to see at nine o'clock. Can I get by on three hours of sleep in a shower? I'm going to try. <laughs> yeah. So. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, my talks were OK. Um, OK. <laughs> so what, what were your topics again? You, you talked well, twice, the, first, right? the first one was supercharger kids talking to parents about things we aren't teaching our kids for the future, for their work and life that we should. Um, and, okay. you know, of course, I was making a few little adjustments and edits up to the last minute because it's the first time I've done it. So I'm still working out kinks and stuff. And I didn't realize I was using open office instead of PowerPoint. And open office is a little harder to use at times, a little clunkier. Uh, right. And I did not realize that I had turned off several slides. So I'm going through the presentation and like, this it's isn't making sense. Out, just somehow you can take them out of the stream because you kind of want to have them for future, but you don't have now, but then, yes. oh, boy, oh boy. Okay. Yeah, and so I got done. I'm like, that wasn't right. There was something I was missing and some of my talk didn't feel flowy right. like it should have. I'm trying to build to this crescendo and I missed a few <laughs> notes on the way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, now I know how to use it properly. And there you go. And the second one went pretty good. Uh, that was uh, actual learning a new skill, video game storytelling for kids and how to prepare for it in the future. Um, and that went fairly good, better than I thought. And we had some fun because the I use a program called Pixicade. I'll put a link. Um, okay. Essentially, you use colored markers and each color represents a wall or a bad guy or something you can move or a goal. And you okay. draw um, a level and then you take a picture of it with the app and it turns it with all the physics into a game. Like... That. See, that's very cool. I mean, I've always went the very first time they started to have visual things like logo or whatever like that, where you did programming, not by typing and having to worry about typos and exact syntax and stuff, but actually just be able to, my robot wants to take this path. And it, right. I don't know, I, I, I said that poorly. It's more like, here's a box for an if then thing. Here's a box for a repeating thing. Here's a, do you know what I mean? It had all the characteristics of how, learning how to code which is its own language and its own mindset right. and making it as approachable and easy as possible. That's a very cool thing. And so now you're seeing that people are going to have not, not something as rudimentary as that level of programming, but how to 
create alternate levels for their favorite yeah. video game because they can imagine, well, the third floor of the castle, it'd be cooler if it was like this. Do you know what I mean? Additional right. things. That's very And good. I'm not focusing on programming. Uh, it's something I talk about, and it's like, you know, start with these steps and do that when you really get into it. It's more about creating a story that works for a video game and how to work on narrative branching stories for video games. Exactly. That's the skill and focus. So it yeah. works well for that. But there's some other tools that work even better. It's just trying to get the time uh, because I was an hour and I felt rushed. Uh, what I need is an hour talk, an hour workshop. So that's a great way to put it. You know, not only like say, so I've often been told, you know, the way to do a good talk is tell them what you're going to tell them and then tell them and then tell them what you told them. Right. And so it's hard to do that all in an hour. And if there really is any kind of experiential component, any kind of hands on, you kind of don't want to interrupt your talk to get to that, but then you should let people take it out for a spin. Right. Maybe they're kind of wandering the room. Like, I don't know, I've been at origami talks where it was very hands-on and they, they, for instance, Dave Platel did a good one where he seems to take a pretty good um, mix between here's how to do it. And then walking around the room and saying, Oh, you're doing uh, that slightly wrong. Let me show you. You right. know what I mean? Correcting errors immediately is a big part of how to, not let people go down a long bad path and then languish at the end where mine doesn't look anything like yours, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and, yeah. and you still have have a quote uh, that we have to get on a t-shirt as we investigate this more. Uh, yes. A couple of years ago, doing the, the duct tape wallets with Marty, uh, if you yes. remember that, you were sitting there and you're like concentrated and doing it. And you went, so when does the fun kick in? And that's just <laughs> such a great t-shirt quote so we've got to put that on a t-shirt I've, I've i wrote it down and i've had it ever since you know so as we move forward with some of our t-shirt thinking and and what we can do to do that that's going to be one of them <laughs> we really do have originals it's very cool that you did that i i have any number of friends in fact mentioning again dave platel that at one point he said the most you ever made me laugh was this good line it's like wow, I, I kind of hardly remember it. I mean, I really am always just kind of chatty and it is situational and throwing things out there. And sometimes they're perfect and pithy and memorable. You know what I mean? I've made it out to any number of quotes out of context discussions of you know, that kind of thing. But I don't know that I always remember. It's not like I... I have a whole bunch of spring loaded and I wait for the opportunity to like thrust it into the conversation. <laughs> yeah. They just kind of pop out. You know what right. I mean? But it's cool that they're good, that they're memorable enough. So yeah, that there was we go. <laughs> definitely good. <laughs> so I, I, can I, I have to, that so much springs to mind. I was at a gathering in Virginia, an ungathering, and we were at breakfast and, um, People were talking, you know how Mensons get, they start riffing, punning on various different things. And someone had arranged their um, grits into a line. And so that was the grit wall of China. <laughs> and the perfect opportunity arose when suddenly the room just got quiet. And I said, you know, that's the only breakfast you can see from space. And people like fell out of their chairs because of course it's absurd. It's, I don't know that it's that great of a line, but it was perfect for, not only was the Great Wall of China funny, but I actually in real time found a great addition to it. And right. people love that when you go back and forth and that it builds instead of just being little bon mots, haha, dropped into conversation. I, I, I love when there's fencing going on. There's volleys right. back and forth. There are certain people like Fred Bert, Bear Bird that he's really good at, you start talking about bread. And he never runs out of bread puns. You know, I'll make a wry comment, you know, and then you start to get more and more obscure. And he just, he's amazing. There's a couple of people that are great at that kind of fencing. I try to be one of them. You know what I mean? So. Right, right. Yeah, I, I've got a, a shirt my kids got me. It says, I like my puns intended. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's a great shirt. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry that we didn't make it. As you know, without a vaccine mandate, it's really tough for us to say, what's our favorite activities? Gaming chatting with people over meals programs and in fact a quick announcement i just got asked to be the publicity person for the upcoming ag in reno slash sparks um and nice. and i had done that for a couple of previous ags and i and and so i'll be doing that again i'm i'm pretty much active on social media so i have a whole bunch of facebook groups that i can post things in and and my my enthusiastic writing style was pretty good at getting um, a lot of people to sign up for both indianapolis and phoenix so having said that there's still no, like in text, on the website, whatever, yes, there's going to be a vaccine requirement. And so I, I kind of said to the chair of Beth, you know, it's going to be hard for me to get the right amount of enthusiasm when I'm not sure I'm going. You know, it, they didn't have one for Kansas City, and that one got canceled because that was early in COVID, and we 
it was more like the hotel and the local laws didn't allow right. for it. We just did one in Texas where, wow, while Texas was full of people in beds in parking lots because they were overwhelming their ICU capability, we still had our gathering and I just couldn't do it. Thank God we didn't have an outbreak. We had, I think they, they said they had one person that tested positive, but it, from the doing a little bit of contract tracking, they didn't say, oh my God, now we're going to have Sturgis, you know, Mensa style. But I, it isn't only about what Mensa should do. It's about me and Colleen. You know, we're both in our 60s. I've had melanoma. I've had atrial fibrillation. There, there's a list of things that you don't want to get COVID because they're complicated when you get that. You know, I'm, I'm pre-diabetic as, as you have some issues with that as well. I so much... Is it just because I've gotten too old to go to places where I really can't breathe the same air as everybody? Right. It's kind of that. And so I, I, I will be doing my job and talking about there's all these cool features, as you know, you know, an RG, an AG is an RG times 10, that many more cool programs and special events, the gala speaker, the Mr. Mensa contest, uh, SEM Mensa is now with both Mr. and Mrs., all kinds of cool stuff. But something deep in me says, wow, the smart group should be smart. We really shouldn't be exposing our best friends to potential complications and a mask mandate is a good step in the right direction, but vaccination is important, so important nowadays. Why aren't we setting that good example? Right. And in fact, it's also, from what I understand, some of the consideration is, well, we don't want to exclude anybody because there are some people that can't get the vaccine. They're too young or they're immunocompromised or whatever else it might be. And I guess my reply is, wow, those are exactly the people you don't want coming to the gathering either the ones that are more at risk not less i don't know you know that's the argument you use when you're just talking to somebody on the street as to why you can't go to a restaurant you can't do immersion for five days in closed spaces with those activities and and feel good about what your chances are and yet i'm just not seeing that line of reasoning always being followed Uh. (laughs) so i I mean you know obviously there are still people out there that don't get it and think, oh, it's not a big deal, or it's over, or whatever. Uh, and I just posted that article yesterday. It's from NPR, which I would hope would be a little more fact-checking, a little more trustworthy in its Absolutely. reporting. Yeah. And it correlated and said, look, of the counties that voted Trump, those people are three times more likely to die from COVID than the counties oh. that voted Biden, if it's an overall look at the county. Right. There you go. I mean, I know people would say, oh, it's all this, that, the other thing. But as an example, I have a friend, my old scout master. He's in his mid 70s. He fell yesterday, hurt his knee, had to go to the emergency room. Which is a dangerous place nowadays. It anyway. is. <laughs> he got there at 3 30 yesterday afternoon yeah. and got home at a quarter to five this morning, uh, like 14 hours. Wow. Because they have 14 beds in the emergency ice and ICU and eight of them are with people on respirators from COVID and right. from everything you hear once you're on the respirator your chances are pretty nil uh-huh. and so these are people that didn't get the vaccine. so he was in the waiting room and there were still guys in there saying this is ridiculous uh they say it's COVID it's all a joke and a lie it's those damn Democrats that are while uh, the mask is going on they're saying it can't be what you say it is yeah uh, that, that's mind-boggling to me i i I don't understand yeah yeah (laughs) you know it i would never have looked for that correlation but groups have made it very political and very like social weirdness as to you you believe in vaccines or not and you take a vaccine I, i just posted a thing with a shirt that says the last variant is communism and like How in the world have you made it that getting a vaccine or not is a political statement or that it's fear of socialism, that you don't want to keep you and your loved ones and your neighbors? And but it has become that there's no denying that it's there, as you said, from your charts. And so I I so much don't want anybody to die of this. If people are going to die, they're now bringing it on themselves. Let it be Darwinism. 99% of the people that are dying are indeed the ones that have refused a vaccine. Yeah. And so I guess Darwin writ large, if you really are like, you know, there's a, there's a great old joke about, you know, someone waiting for God to save them from being on a rooftop of a flooded yes. house. And he's like, I sent you a motorboat. I sent you a rowboat. I sent you a helicopter. <laughs> Didn't you take the hint right. that I was trying to help you, that it isn't the hand of God reaching <laughs> down from out of the clouds to save you? There, there's uh. that <laughs> meme that was going around. Uh, it showed a Viagra pill from Pfizer. It says, you know, you trust us with this. 
<laughs> you know, and 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 I bet those same people, oh, the the government and vaccines and this. Hey, can I have an aspirin because I have a headache? <laughs> See, I, you know, it's kind of the number of examples that we can start naming of like, how in the world have you gotten to this place of like you don't know what's in a hot dog and yet you eat them, and that that's the argument you use about the and like, okay, it's someone just someone just had their cousin die like Monday, and. It, it was along the lines of he said he didn't do it because it was you know untested and we're all guinea pigs and so it's well, so first of all um it might have been that at the start that you were worried about that but after you've seen millions hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine given out without huge drastic side effects you got to say well we have been through the experiment and it's being proven to be that it's 99.999 effective against the disease and no bad side effects right. and if you do any kind of looking into it it isn't just hey i whipped this up in the lab let's try it it was 20 years in the making in terms of investigating mrna technology and vaccines themselves are 70 years in the making and so so many of the arguments it, this happens all the time the first thing they say is what they're going to stick to they're not going to learn anything new they're not going to listen to any other opinions or learned opinions or facts in kind of that order they just feel that somehow they're showing weakness if they don't stick to their gun. <laughs> well, no matter how feeble and foolish and ill-advised that gun that they chose is. I, 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 so I, it really is getting to the fuck it, then die. You know right. what I mean? I, I don't, people I don't, might argue and say I'm wrong and it might be a harsh statement, but personally, I will point almost every bit of the problems we're having right now to the last president. And if I'm wrong on that, he absolutely then tell was me how I'm wrong. And, uh, and he, he announced it was a hoax. He didn't take it seriously. He had stripped out all of our protections that we had for how to handle pandemics that had been built not just by the Obama administration, but by like 10 previous presidential yeah. administrations. And so that that weirdness of creating a problem and then saying you're the only one to solve it, but then failing to solve it, but then finding someone to blame that's kind of like the Republican rule book writ large. Sorry, not just Trump, but it's kind of weird. I don't mean to get into political discussions. Right. And yet the data is there. The pattern is there to be found. How many times have we had a budget discussion that the budget doesn't matter when they are cutting taxes and overspending and so forth. But the minute that the other side is in office, it's all about the budget deficit. It's always about the debt, the debt ceiling. And like, wow. And, and unfortunately, it seems to work enough times. Yeah. The public just says, oh, God, gas prices are going up. It's this guy's fault. It's like, no, it's a complex thing. And the oil companies that are <laughs> in, in charge of gas prices and maybe oil reserves, it's not just a matter of the U.S. Right. You know, releasing its strategic oil reserves. How much profiteering is being done whenever there's a crisis? And you can see the data and prove that that's happened again and again. Right now, I, I just, inflation. Oh, gosh, prices are going up. There's so much proof. Then inflation is not a matter of uh, what really causes it, that is um, wage inflation or low bower, uh, low borrowing rates or whatever else it might be. It's the companies that are raising prices on the, the standard basket of goods, if you will, um, they've made record profits. They're not getting squeezed by the supply chain. They're not getting squeezed by um, uh, uh, labor difficulties and so forth. They're just saying we can raise prices with impunity and so we will, but we need a scapegoat. Ah, huh, inflation, magic word. And How many people will do we have us. going on? Oh. So uh, to sum that up, the, the one thing I, I remember every single time to sum that up is after the election and Biden was elected and there were still problems with COVID, still problems with people with the vaccine and stuff. And you started seeing the posts of everybody blaming Obama. What? That it's his exactly. fault about the vaccines. What if it, it, you can't? That's the my problem is you can't argue with something that stupid with somebody that totally believes it. And, and you know we've thrown that word around stupid or whatever. And I know kids get yelled at. Don't call somebody stupid. I have no other word when it's right. that stupid. <laughs> it's you know, and there are levels of that. There's the irrationality of not being able to like follow how a line of thought works there's the unacceptance of facts of science or whatever yeah. else it might be but there's just I, I, we, I know we must have talked about this before one thing that's absolutely coming into my come into my vocabulary over the last probably 10 years is the dunning-kruger effect yes that one that what it is about is when you're stupid or incompetent or just lower level in terms of your ability to interact with the world not even saying that just saying there's a topic 
that you don't have all the knowledge of. It doesn't exactly. matter whatever else. But, but what it is, is it's about your inability to judge how right. well you know that topic, that you have yes. um, ridiculous confidence in your ability to handle situations. And one of the situations that you don't have any competence in is judging that. So the That's... Dunning-Kruger effect is about you're stupid about knowing whether you're stupid or not. You shouldn't be that confident. You should be able to say, I only got a certain amount of data. And I only have so much experience. And hey, if I think for a minute, someone with a lot of experience and a lot of data and a proven track record of correct conclusions, maybe I should listen to him right. instead of going out there, puff your chest out and orate about some ridiculous. Right. And so that I see that all the time. That and, and in the past, I had dealt with it kind of on a smaller scale. There are certain occupations where it's really important for you to look like you know what you're talking about because you're in situations that are about that often. As a police, you can't show uncertainty. A policeman, police woman. As a lawyer, you can't. As a, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, right. anywhere, anywhere where you have to, like as a, a military guy, you have to be able to follow orders and tell others what their orders are without there being any hesitation, any maybe not. Well, unfortunately sometimes when you're a lawyer you kind of can't turn that off and so you're dealing with a plumbing problem at home and you're like well i'm a lawyer so i know all about everything and that just isn't the case and that's where i used to see it in kind of isolated incidents where your job has formed you into this overconfident and everything guy and now it's like just living in this world has formed certain people into this I don't know I, what it is, I, but, it, I've but tried to, there. <laughs> I've tried to use the knowledge of what that is, the Dunning-Kruger effect uh, for myself, that when I start like, yeah, you know, that's like this. I'm like, wait a second. I'm really not an expert in this. Maybe I should back off and find out more. But then on the opposite, when I hear someone starting to spout this and the other thing, I'm like, oh, well, you're like that lower 20% that knows nothing about this. So I'm not even listening to you. And, you know, when, when you compare, you can see that you're being cautious. You're having some humility. You know, I don't know, there's a, a great quote, maybe from Bertrand Russell that says, you know, the problem with the world is that fools are certain all the time and wise men are filled with doubt. And so whenever you have to say, well, here's what I think it is, but here's all the caveats as to the limits of our knowledge and the significant digits that we can take this calculation out to, that every one of those hedges, which is reality, still comes across as, well, he's not a bold man taking charge. What? You know what I mean? Like I get, <laughs> oh man, I get that with the, the computer development and database stuff all the time that I'm, I'm, I'm asked to do this, that, and the other thing. And then, you know, well, how do you think that's going to turn out? Well, you know, it could be this because of this and this, we got to look at this and there's this factor. And, you know, we think, and, and they're like, well, don't you know what you're doing? Well, yeah, that's why I'm telling you <laughs> that I'm there's you, all these complex things. instead of simple. Exactly. Yes. You know? <laughs> So uh, jumping back real quick, uh, one second, one of the great things about the RG this past weekend was uh, I have a card game that's a Christmas elf card game that I have been working on. And I took that and we play tested it a bit. So it was nice to play test with some people that love to play games and was able to really dig into it a bit. Uh, it still needs some tweaking, you know, it, that it's so hard. People don't realize how hard it really is to create something new that's fun and playable and you know all the different but things that go into it. of all those things especially when there's so many games already out there to find something that has that unique element but that it isn't by going unique you now become obscure or unplayable or right. something like that so but yeah. hopefully the people that you had there were indeed some of the people that would be able to give you better feedback than usual because they play games all the time and yes they can say, well it's kind of like this game but with these rules changed but then here's why it's better or worse than them and then you can tweak based on that feedback that's yeah. very cool okay. so and it's it's you know just one of those creative endeavors uh that's yeah. fun to work on and and twist your mind around uh you know yeah. that game has been through like five six different iterations with changes to cards and rules and everything yeah so it's really close there's just one little bit more and i think it'll be fun to play so. good for you you know that, that's there, there sure are enough stories of people that they they have a good feel from playing lots of games as to what kinds of things they enjoy. And it isn't only that there's one kind of game. Every time that we go to mind games, as you know, there's 20 different overall categories of games. And you can be successful by being social but simple or by being a, an all day long conquer the world type game or a resource development game or an abstract strategy game. And I kind of like all different kinds of things. 
And one of the things that's often proposed at mind games is that people should be able, if you will, to specialize and only play the strategy games because that's what they most love. But I think that some of the feedback that you have to give the game developers is not, this will only fit 10% of the market. There's this small niche. It really is. You should be able to give feedback. You should have to give feedback on all different kinds of games because at first blush, any kind of gaming experience is still going to help you give better feedback than just yeah. standard people. You know what I mean? So when I want to know when I play something that, doesn't really matter what my experience is it matters that i try to give feedback and a lot of other people there do not just rating it but kind of saying here's the ways in which the quality of the materials was better or worse than it needed to be yes. <laughs> or yeah. here's the way that it has it's a great game but you can play it once it doesn't have any replayability because you actually like tear cards up while you're playing or something like that yeah, you know yeah, and those games yeah but so I love that because, as you know, I have the variety, the novelty gene. And so I love being exposed to all those various different things. And I often don't play just the minimum number that I have to. I try to fit as many different games as I can in that weekend. And I do go sleepless and stuff like that or some <laughs> I, and not, not going you know, totally oblivious, I guess. But that always informs coming out for like Christmas. I, we play that in, in usually April. And then to see those games come to market and to see that sometimes they have incorporated some of the suggestions from Mensa's, that's very heartening that yeah. it wasn't just, yeah, we did it to try to get the Mensa select seal, but that we actually listened to you guys who are avid game players and we made it better. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's always great. Like that. and, yeah. and, you know, if I'm a, a worker placement strategy gamer, and that's what I really love if that's all I focused on, the problem is, you know, well, this is my 15th one this weekend, and I just don't like this game because I don't like the mechanic of having to do this, that, and the other thing. Right. Okay, that's fine, but now you're like, I want every game I play to be just like the ones I like, you know? So, right. yeah. so you got to try and judge them on the game itself, uh, yeah. and that's and, rough. And I, this is kind of, I, <laughs> I have many times in the past said, I've learned more about people from gaming with them for an hour than I've known when I've known them for 10 years. Right. And part of the weirdness of going to mind games is when you really get to people that, wow, they have, they have no depth. They have no capacity for complexity. They don't think moves plies ahead in various different games. They, how they play like uh, cooperative games. They're not a cooperative person. This is really hard for them. And I know that that's a weird thing, but I really have kind of, pigeonholed various different people and it's proven to be true when it's like wow she really went off on someone over nothing in a game and that's not only in a game do you know what i mean yeah yeah or the people that are rules nazis as we often call them and they're like wow they're always looking for what rules and not only because they want to know the rules because they can be the enforcer of the rules right and you see that play out in their lives and so I think there's something very cool not only about learning about the games but that exposure to 300 different mensons and I, I think I've been about 98% right <laughs> nice. about picking up on, wow, I'll, I'll remember that about this person. And, and not in a way I don't condemn them, but it really is it, it, just like it, we've often talked about what's the Enneagram, what's the Myers-Briggs. These are other data points for understanding what works in a person, what their default problem solving thing is, what their default socializ socializing thing is. And then it's just good to know that going in for future interactions, I guess. It, you know it, what I mean? So it's difficult to hide or mask your true self and personality playing a game. Uh, it really kind of shows who you really are when you're yeah. just in a social setting or you're in charge of a group or anything, you can kind of act one way or the other. But when you're playing a game, it slips because you're, if you're really concentrating on the game, uh, yeah. it's a good indicator. Like you said, yeah. you know, this is kind of an odd, I, maybe this is a little bit back padding. I hope you don't mind it. Early on, I realized I really wasn't a killer. Like when we would play this as a family, it was like some people, if they have the advantage, they press the advantage and they wipe you from the board. Yeah. And somehow when I would get someone, I would play the game and strategize and do well. But when it came down to like they have one country left final combat, I went back to like medieval times. It's like, I'm not rolling three dice against your one. Let's go one die against one die. I sent my champion, you send your champion and we're going to do this kind of like more nobly yes and, and I, I and I, there's any number of times i'm not kidding that i didn't get them because they rolled spectacularly with one die their sixes beat my fives and fours and so forth then they took cards and then they just came right roaring back you know with 30 50 armies or whatever like that and so sometimes nobility costs you 
And yet I never stopped doing that. I don't know what it was. My parents didn't teach me that. My friends didn't teach me that. There was something about, I just didn't want to like crush them. I wanted to say, here we are at the end. You get to make a good stand. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, well. Well, I, I think some of that is because it's more about playing the game and having fun than about whoever wins. And, yeah. you know, I, I yeah. think that really is a lot of what gets back to that. And I will also say this. So what I just said, oh, I'm all noble. I'm helping them out. Somebody once said, you're like a cat playing with a, a bird, like with a mouse that you, now that you know you have it, now you're toying with it. It's like, no, 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 that's not what I'm, that's not how it appears to other people all the time. So I'm, I'm aware of that too, that what I thought I was doing as a favor, they took it as, why are you drawing this out? Why don't you just fucking kill me? Right, yeah, yeah. Been there, so. done that. So let, speaking of jumping back, let's get back. Uh, you've mentioned a couple times uh, of watching the Beatles uh, documentary that's on lately. So tell oh. us about that. I haven't gotten a chance to catch it yet, but it's a series, right? It's a series. It's three long episodes, like two, two and a half hours each. I think it's a total of eight. So they're like wow. two and a half plus each. And it's from the act of them, you know, um, making the Let It Be album. So they're it's kind of the twilight of the Beatles. There's starting to be fractures in them. Uh, George Harrison leaves the group for a while, but comes back. You can see who who's, I don't know, they've been the Beatles for a long time. They've had incredible fame, incredible spotlight on them. This isn't about that. It's about them working in the studio and being together. And you can see that they're still good friends. They're incredibly playful with each other. Sometimes even when there's difficult things happening, it's a fascinating thing about this was, and in the act of staying camera on, these guys it isn't the selective snippets that you often get from biopics they don't compress things down you see them tootling around strumming playing and get back emerges like in real time this amazing memorable fantastic song comes out of paul mccartney's fingers on guitar and people are contributing lyrics and they're you know ringo joins in on drums and so it starts to form up but just seeing the creative process the the light coming on, the birth of things. And that's not the only song they do this with. It's fascinating. And it's, uh, I don't know, it makes me revere the Beatles all the more that just from the act of noodling around, they're going to come up with a, this song will sell a hundred million copies. It's, you know, the long and winding road and um, let it be. We haven't gotten to that yet, but I know it's going to be something like whoever, I think it's Paul's song, when he offers it, the whole group's going to go, let's do that one let's you know what i mean sometimes when i'm sure that the first time that uh tommy shaw played renegade for sticks they all said this is a monster hit let's make this as good as we can and a number of groups must know that sometimes the record company executives are pressuring them to produce hits but once in a while somebody walks into the room with smells like teen spirit with you know um there's there's certain things the first time you hear them on the radio you got to know by alanis morissette it was like Oh man, that's like the perfect song for that kind of song in that voice with flea on bass and whatever. You know what I mean? It's just, it, I, I, I'll, I I'll push that. <laughs> I'll push back on that a little bit um, okay. <laughs> because I've been in the situation writing music and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and I've you know, interviews from actual bigger names and stuff like that. That's not actually the case most often. There are so many times the song that becomes the hit is the one they did weren't go put on the record or the one that you know they didn't think was that great and everyone else loves it and, or this is the one this is go make us or break us and it flops you know it, it happens you. way often <laughs> you're, you're, exactly so what i was thinking about the beatles i'm sure that they had any, like you said any number of surprise hits and and also it's not always collaborative i remember reading about the yeah. making of left overture by kansas that carrie levergan kept coming in with great song after great song and usually steve walsh and others contributed but they just kind of like we we can't top this every one of these songs is fantastically stellarly good let's go with them and then sometimes people get writer's block and they fade away a little bit and then somebody else kind of swoops in i don't know uh uh i it was i guess i really love seeing the creative process a, a couple things if you're at all a beatles fan it's really obvious that yoko didn't break up the beatles that's such a canard that's been passed around yeah. she's an easy target though <laughs> she's an easy target but it really wasn't 
some part of what's been said in the press maybe is that she wasn't interfering. She wasn't continually chiming in and acting as if she were a beetle and saying, oh no, this is good, this is not good. She pretty much sat at John's side and she might've been a distraction and she might've been that she was by magnetism pulling him out of the Beatles because they were gonna go do other things. But while she was in the studio, that was not the case. Billy Preston coming in was the guy that finished that album. They're all having difficulty sometimes getting to that good version. The lyrics are not always what you expect them to be in the final thing. And Billy Preston just having this great soulful, playful keyboard playing that he does not only all the fills, but like his energy, his, his joy, his love of playing makes everybody like really to take this so seriously. You know, we're grinding this out. How if we just try things? And it's very obvious that you know, people always talk about who was the fifth Beatle. I don't know if I call him the fifth Beatle because I think it was only for that one or two albums. But nonetheless, he was so much the spark that they needed. Not George Martin, the producer, not Yoko, not um, Linda McCartney when she was Linda Eastman. Eastman. Eastman, exactly. She came in. And, you know, just that, for people that I admire so much, it was very cool to see a little bit maybe feet of clay where they're not always perfect they can be belligerent they can be but it's also they really are even better than i ever imagined paul mccartney is made of music yeah you know what i mean that guy has made like we've talked about him billy joel elton john randy newman they've written a hundred great songs not like two albums worth like 30 albums worth oh yeah of an entire career neil morse from spock's beard who people don't know as much but when i've seen him do a, do a concert about here's what I was doing and thinking while I was creating these various different things and him talking through, no, you got to go, you know, from G back to D or whatever. It's like, they speak the musical language. They, they just try things and then it sounds just right or it doesn't, but they immediately know what to do to play with it, fix it, give somebody else a better lick. And, and hopefully that the egos are not so much in a way, part of what led to George Harrison leaving for a while was that he was kind of being talked to too much about what to play instead of being also a, a creative input to the group. So I don't know for Paul and George are very, um, sorry, Paul and Ringo, the two surviving Beatles, very brave to release this warts and all. And in fact, what I understand, like Disney is, is the guys that put it out. They were like, well, we got to tone this down. You know, on the Disney channel, it's got swearing. And they kind of said, are you kidding me? We're like late twenties guys. We, we, you know, that's what you do when you're in the studio and something isn't working out, you know? Right. <laughs> So, yeah. so it's it really is authentic. I I just loved it. Nice. I just it's I, it's really really. <laughs> it's on my list. list. Yeah, you know. So and it really is. We didn't watch it all the way through. We didn't even binge like single episodes. They're two and a half hours. We kind of like okay. I kind of I'm kind of full of this. Let's go come back to it. We interspersed it with the latest British baking show holiday episodes or whatever <laughs> else we're watching. You know what I right. mean? <laughs> well, you, you were talking about the the creation and that. I know uh, Paul has said he and John, one of them would come up with a song, the riff, the main idea. And the other was like, oh man, now I got to come up with something that's better. And so that competition right. helps <laughs> a lot too. But, you, you know, we mentioned the fifth Beatle, George Martin. Um, I, I think back to Def Leppard because they came out with Pyromania and they were like the hard rock band of 84. You know, okay. that, that was a huge album, huge hit for them in the career. And still and, also young, you know what I mean? Very so they, young. So that's potential in front of them. Exactly. Yeah, and then they go in the studio, and the the execs say, "We're going to give you Mutt Lang, who has done Meatloaf, uh, and um, she did uh, uh, was it Bonnie Raitt or some kind of, Carrie Underwood, you know, one of those that okay. kickstarted them. So a a big producer, and he basically helped put the songs together so that every single song was a hit." That he even said that was his goal. He's like, why can't you have an album where every song is a top 10 hit? And so he helped create that. And yeah. it took Leopard to a whole nother level with Hysteria. And that's still like one of the top 10 albums ever sold and all that jazz, you okay. know? So yeah. Th yeah. there's something to be said, not always for the musicians. You get that right combination with the engineer or producer and songwriter, Bernie Taupin and Elton John, you know, That's look right. how many That's songs right. they put together at collaboratively. Yeah. So one thing they haven't talked about, I know that Alan Parsons, for instance, figured into some Beatles albums around this same period, as well as Pink Floyd and other things, but they haven't like named him and showed him instead. It was, um, I don't remember all the names. Um, the wizard, 
a guy that like actually made the entire studio that they were going to record in and was really good at cobbling things together because at that point they were going from like four to eight track to be able to just have that many tracks to be able to record on that things don't have to share. They, they haven't talked about the production values as much, but part of what makes them those Beatles albums beautiful is that they glisten with great production. You know what I mean? So it, it, um, it comes across much more, more organic. Nobody's telling them what to do. There, there even is like, hey, we have a TV special coming up. You got to get these songs done so we can put the album out so that we can have this special. And then it doesn't happen that way, but nobody is able to tell the Beatles, oh, now we're, you're, you're, you, you have to do this, especially even if you're not ready, or now you lose a lot of money, that there was so much like, whatever you're ready, we'll take it, because we know that you are still the guys in rock and roll. <laughs> you yeah. Know I mean? So Yeah, they've great, never but... really had to worry about having jobs or if they were going to make money off something. You know, they, exactly. and, and yeah. it almost is, you know, there you go, right there, uh, with all the success, all the money, all the, everything you had in life, and John didn't even get to stick around and enjoy it, uh, you know, and then George, he, yeah, he did live okay life, but still not like Paul and Ringo now, you know, I mean, George has been yeah. dead 20 years, 25 years or I, I something. Think just, exactly. That's, I, this, I just, uh, Colleen just read this and informed me of this. You know, he got shot outside the Dakota in New York, a, a, a hotel slash apartment building, if I remember correctly. And Faye Dunaway was living there at the time. And she actually heard the shots that took him wow. out so that i mean I, you know there really is always interconnections that you just don't imagine you know you don't want to hear bullet sounds on city streets and then to find out that it wasn't sadly a stray shot that it was actually a terrible thing right. to take out john lennon so wow yeah, <laughs> yeah. but yep. you know beatles uh colin that's like his favorite group ever yeah. Um, you know, who hasn't heard the Beatles? Heck, uh, Gunslinger, Stephen King, the whole series practically revolves around Hey Jude. <laughs> That's really true. You know, I was inspired. I have lots of Beatles albums, but not enough. I don't have a complete catalog. And they haven't always been e easy to get because right. Apple has been quite uh, fringe, I don't know, like stingy about releasing things. But at least what I'm probably going to do to get for Colleen and I is get like the greatest hits, the red and the blue or the one, I think right. that one of the ones I have. And it, I really love listening to albums the way that they were put out because I think there's a, a time capsule aspect and the, the um, artist is much more in charge of what order they want things played and stuff like that. So I don't know that I always go for greatest hits collections. And yet I want to be able to put on just this thing has 40 great Beatles songs. That's what I want to hear while I'm wrapping Christmas gifts this year. Yes. Lots of Beatles. You there, know there's, I mean? a, so. <laughs> there's that time and, and the kids nowadays, we've talked about this. They don't understand the pleasure of listening to an album all the way through the way it was intended. Uh, and, you know, they're really just everything's got to be a greatest hits album. Uh, it, but I go through depends on the time of day. Sometimes I'll just hit, you know, pull out. 10, 12 albums from different artists, put them in a jumble and hit, you know, random. And Sometimes random. I'll say, oh, yeah. I really feel like Tom Petty. So I'm going to start with his first album and I'm going to go all the way through his albums. Or I really right. love this album. It's on repeat for the rest of the week. You know? <laughs> See, I hardly ever do that. I hardly ever listen to albums that you actually get a second listen in a row from me are extraordinarily rare really but once in a while it's like boy i just want to hear that again because i i have listened to it for six months and one isn't going to be enough i don't wait another so i <laughs> i think i mentioned i there's an album by um thomas dolby called astronauts and heretics and he got some radio play and so forth but it's perfect every single cut on the album that's what i'll call a perfect album where there's no clinkers there's no filler everything is great and it very much portrays him and it just there's so many things that like i get a little earworm it's like i really need to hear that song again those four songs again so there's certain things that are that are like that i'll yeah wow um <laughs> dolby's one of those artists that had a little radio airplay and you wouldn't say he was successful in the sense of top 40 hits and you know posters on the wall and stuff right. but He's extremely well respected and liked throughout the industry and music aficionados. Yeah, I'll listen to Thomas Dolby, you know, it, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And there, there's actually kind of a set of like 80 guys. I really like Howard Jones. I really like yes, Thomas yes. Dolby. I like the Thompson twins. I like Tears for Fears that they, they they stood out. There was so much 
oh, look, I bought a little 16 key keyboard and I'm going to go painted love. Mah, 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 mah. Like that's just not enough of a song to me. But other people made beautiful music. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's, it, so I still listen to those to this day. Howard Jones is one of those guys. I'll listen to like his first four or five albums in a row. Yeah. Because when I'm having a Howard Jones Jones, haha, I really don't want to leave anything out. I want to hear until he until he got obscure and those albums, later albums, haven't grabbed me as much. But those first like four, yeah. there's great stuff all the way through. I love Howard Jones. And, yeah. well, one of the albums I do Tom got... Petty like you do, by the way. I'll put on Tom Petty. He has a box set that is like all kinds of B-sides, rarities, back from the Mud Crutch days and stuff. And I'll be like, sides one to four, here we go. I, right. I, I, CDs one to four, I should say, sides. <laughs> oh, man, exactly. Oh, wow, uh, did you tape that? What right. side of the, of the cassette? Ka-chunk eight track. <laughs> exactly, I know. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, albums, groups, uh, that just floored me the first time I heard it was Third Stage by Boston. That album is one of those that you can't just listen to one song. The album is constructed in a way that each song leads yeah. to the next so well. And uh, who was it? Tom Wood. Yeah. 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 Uh, did such amazing work to get the sonic pleasure of that album all exactly. over. And, if I remember right, there's even a little blip on the album where he talks about at one point the master tape got gluey. And yeah, because he spent lost. like six, seven years or something. <laughs> exactly. And so it's like, oh, thank God that wasn't lost. And he'll yeah. start over because talk about a punch in the face that would be. Right. Okay. And and uh, Rush is one, and Led Zeppelin sometimes, those two bands, if I get in the mood quite often, I put an album number one, okay, two, three, four, and I go exactly. through the catalog. That's me too. In fact, I've actually... I, I hardly have ever created playlists for purposes like this is the party, this is the driving. Most of what I've done is I want to listen to an album, a, a group where there's all kinds of things, but I want to listen to them chronologically, like you're saying. So you can't listen to Jethro Tull because the first album alphabetically is A, and that's like their 18th album. So I've, I've done it for Jethro Tull, for Kansas, for Alan Parsons Project, where I really want to hear them chronologically because you can kind of right. hear them develop as an artist. You can hear, you can remember the period of your life, Steely Dan wise. You can say, that's the, I was riding my bike to that song. That's why, that's what I, I get the reminiscence as well as the appreciation for their music. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Steely Dan's another one that, I enjoy much more that I've gotten older than I did when I was younger, that it's okay. grown on me even more, you know? Yeah, I, I, I would say that's true. They weren't one of my absolute favorites when I was growing up, but Kali really likes them. And so I've been playing more of them. And now I'm like, wow, I, they're, they have always been good. I just didn't, whatever that frame of mind that I was in, that I was much more into all of my prog rock instead of jazz rock, that now I've added them to my, I'll listen to them anytime. I really yeah. enjoy them. Yeah, exactly. Definitely good musicians there. Donald Fagan and yeah. oh, I forget Elder. the other guy. Who? Uh, so um, I, Donald I, Fagan I, and Felder, right? Dan? Felder, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah. Well, we, we can't miss them because these guys are important. Just a minute. Uh, They're not remembering. No. I always sorry, remember Fagan. Dan. Star, sorry, we so respect you, but why is it not popping out? Yeah. They both did solo albums. They both. Yeah. And let, let's you know, not talk okay, about pop up. Right. the, the uh, uh, Walter Becker. Jesus. Becker. Walter Becker and Donald exactly Fagan. That. Jeez, there, you go. there we go. In fact, that's probably why. Usually they're said in that order. And so then you say the last one first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did it backwards. And, and you know, let's not talk about the origination of their name. Uh, if you don't know what that is, go ahead and look that up. We'll leave exactly. to that. I believe William Burroughs first used it in a book, as I recall. Really? Those damn British, they, they, they always do that stuff. So we, you've mentioned a couple of times uh, some of the... Um, the, the inventions and some of the stuff from this time life magazine before it gets to be too old and we get to next year's t time, time life, life uh what's the more of the stuff from that that you've so been reading it, and I, when i talked about a little bit before really the overall thing is it's so heartening you know what i mean we we often talk about well things are tough in the world right now things are very polarized there's a lot of non-thinking going on but when you see these inventions coming out that are just improving the world in a hundred different ways and and that it's not only pure science, it's like they're very human. So, and it's kind of funny, I, because I knew I wouldn't remember 100, but I wanted to like scroll through and bring things up. There are things like um, 
uh, with artificial intelligence, it isn't only about, hey, we um, figured out how to do finances better. There are things like, um, if you're gonna have inspections of pipes that you really have to keep working, the combination of um, creating little drones or robots that can be in those pipes without human beings, and then being able to put together all those data sets to say, not only something is actively broken, but prediction that says, um, if we're going to try to get to this before it breaks, which is a disaster, but do preventative maintenance, they've made huge advances with um, cities are filled with, you know, 10 and 20 and 50 and 100 and 200 year old pipes or electric or various different public utilities. And they're making great advances on how to do that so that it's the least amount of tearing up Main Street disruption. Yeah. You know what I mean? And look, so look, the people are working the, uh, very practical things. It's very cool. Look at the the building, that uh, apartment building that collapsed and it had just been inspected and the guy warned everybody, and, you know? And exactly. I think that's cool because when people think of top 100 inventions, they're thinking of the sleek pop culture stuff, the new cars, the, the new, new radio car, car show or something yeah. like that. I exactly. think it's cool that yeah. they, they recognize, hey, this is important and this is a big deal. Exactly. Um, so like I said, I'm going to page around a little bit. Let's see. Um, a, a, a very human thing. Um, so uh, the world of entertainment is international. A film gets made in a certain country and with a certain language and culture, and then it gets often distributed. Sometimes it's with subtitles. Sometimes they dub it. Well, you and I have watched, I'm sure, movies from Japan, France, Germany, etc., where they got the dubbing pretty close, but it's not quite right. <laughs> and it's actually very disconcerting. And like, Woody Allen level funny of that's not what the guy was really saying. It can't be. <laughs> They're now making it that between them being able to digitize film and be able to actually manipulate like kind of like old um, uh, Scott McCloud Space Rangers where only the mouse moved and being able to speed up, slow down, manipulate language, they can make it that it looks like it's in whatever language you're dubbing it into. Oh. So now, Finnish people are not feeling left out because it looks like the guy is speaking authentic Finnish in a Star Wars movie or whatever else it might be. That's, That's amazing. Cool. I've been, I mean, I've been reading and keeping up with a lot of the AI technology and voice technology for using AI robots. So one of the things they're saying is probably going to come about here in the future is if you buy the audiobook of whatever your favorite novel that right. you can choose a voice to have it read to you back and it's computer generated uh it's not there yet because like acx doesn't allow computer generated voices it has to be okay. read by a person but then you could also have that book read in your language uh wherever you're at and translated on the fly in a voice that sounds like your country uh, male exactly. female young old yeah and that, that leads exactly into another invention. You know, we now we're talking obviously on you know wonderful video streaming and um, they have international meetings. And instead of it being that we're going to have to have everybody speak English because that's ha -ha, the lingua franca. That's one of my favorite jokes is like even that we, you know, English <laughs> tends to like knock people down and steal their terms. You know, it's the Swiss army knife of languages. That's another one. Right. So um, they're now making it that because translation has become so good and computers so mighty that they can do it in real time. When you're having an international meeting or a United Nations session, or a, you can have it be that everybody is hearing in their language what's being said in near real time. Nice. It isn't, uh, and I guess, sorry, translators who there might be, uh, uh, I don't think they'll be out of their jobs as much as they'll be the guys that are now advising. Well, there's idiomatic language. It, it um, being able to create these translation algorithms is still as a matter of dictionary to dictionary uh, correspondence that's not exact. And so there's still going to be a whole bunch of work as they try to translate not into the top 10 languages, but how about the top 20 and 50 and 100 so that soon, and it's not only that we have to cover how many is it nowadays, 270 nations, you kind of have to cover all the dialects of Chinese, all the dialects right. of Bantu or whatever else it might be. So I just, the fact that they can do that in near real time is the Babel fish. It's something that used to be science fiction. And someone said, give us a chance with our NVIDIA chips to catch up and we'll be there soon. <laughs> That's, and, and yeah, you're right. That probably will put a lot of translators out of business. Not that that's like a huge 
number of people in the world it's it's right. there are people but I, that's one of the things i did talk about in my one talk it's like it's always happened to folks that, that you know people lament oh we're losing these jobs but they're always getting replaced with something new you know i mean i ask everybody i'm like new opportunities too yeah exactly. I, I ask everybody how many of you went to the blacksmith to get new shoes on your horse before you rode over here to the rg you know <laughs> like the, or exactly. or how many of you told the caboose uh, driver, thank you for bringing the train so you could get here. None of us, you know, we all right. drove. Those <laughs> jobs are gone. How many of you pick up a phone and ask the operator to dial your None. So I, I understand that if it was my job, I'd be lamenting and <laughs> griping too. Right. Yeah. But then there's always new opportunities uh, coming about too. So, exactly. in fact, that's, you know, not only loving the future, but also being a little bit of an investor in it. Like, so battery technology gets better and better. That's one of those things that there's so much research going into it. And it, it involves real interesting, you know, material science, which I've always loved. Do we really understand fully how lithium batteries operate, how nickel metal hydride does, and what variations can we try on that? And how do we keep tweaking that so we get more and more power out of less and less space or with cheaper materials or whatever the constraints might be. So there's all kinds of things where now there's a, a, a cover for your phone that like is as thin as the one you used to put on just to protect it in case you dropped it so you wouldn't crack the screen, but it's got a battery in it now. So that's now how you keep your, your phone charged is that thing can, can give you 16 hours instead of eight hours of battery life or whatever else it is it makes it so that you being without charge kind of never happens <laughs> you know they have charging stations going on everywhere now for evs electric vehicles and i just saw an ad for like hey we're going to make that into kind of a, a cock robin type drive-in while you're getting your vehicle charged someone will come out and serve you your burger it's like what a how do I invest? What a perfect opportunity for if I'm going to be having to cool my heels for 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how mighty the charger is and what kind of car you have, perfect opportunity for someone on roller skates yeah. <laughs> to bring you your food. You know and, what I mean? And so. how long before you could uh, you know, sit there and watch some episode of a TV show or a movie or something at the same time? You know, Like you that, know. exactly. Another thing they talked about is that if you've seen this ad on TV, um, a particular model of the Ford F-150, if I remember correctly, has a mighty enough battery that in case your house loses power and you don't have a generator, you can hook your truck up and give your house a, a night's worth of power. Wow. And so like, what an interesting, you know, they're talking about how we're going to get our cars charged. We put enough power out to our garage so that when we finally go EV instead of hybrid, we'll be able to do it out there. But it's also, we're going to get the solar panels on so that we're going to be able to charge things to our house and not have it and have, charge our car up. And if it turns out that the car has more charge than the house currently does, it'll be playing back and forth with all the right regulators so that it maximizes your available power depending on what your situation is nice. and, and can't you know it's got the little chips in that are going to say well here's how low and i'll let you know can't overcharge so it can't blow up on you or anything like that there's there's all kinds of wonderful monitoring it's not quite the universe of things but at least associated with things like that they've all got little governor chips on them now so that they are the guy that you'd want to say checking your battery level ten thousand times a minute to let you know how you're doing that little idiot savant chip is doing those things for you and sending you a text to your phone when it is getting low. You know what I mean? It, there's nice. just such interesting sparks it, it, being built yeah. in that way. <laughs> yeah, you definitely aren't going back to getting your horseshoe shot. Exactly. Um, <laughs> let's see. A whole bunch of AR and VR type stuff, like, you know, better and better glasses or goggles that are going to give you um, screens that you can drop down and, and interact with as if there's a computer on your head. AR so nice. that you can see for the world. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that. You know, uh, what's the name of that mountain over there? What's the name of this person that I'm yes. meeting? Oh, I met him before, but I can't remember their name and I'm embarrassed. You know what I mean? That yeah. kind of stuff. And, and there's a certain amount of <laughs> inclusion quick, for that. <laughs> quick update on that now that you mention it. Uh, everybody around here has been, for, for some reason, if it's a tech thing or whatever, everyone looks to me and says, so when are we getting it? I, I'm making the final decision. And I'm not sure why that happens other than I'm the tech guy. I get that. Yeah. But then the when we don't. It, now it's your obligation. Yeah. But, but then when we don't have it, because I don't think it's the right time or we're not ready for it or whatever reason, then everyone like it's grumpy with me. It's like, well, you got a job. Go get your own. I mean, shut up. <laughs> anyway, um, everybody's been like, why, why don't we have VR goggles yet? You know, I, and I, my answer is, well, because I don't want all you sweaty kids using my VR goggles, but uh, <laughs> I don't think 
that I didn't want to get a VR goggle set. It's like, oh, I can only buy from this store and these other games are exclusive over here, so I can't play them. And then these other yeah. ones are over. And I was just like, that's... There's first mover advantage, but there's first mover limitations because you yeah. got to commit to some... I know what you're saying. I've done that with too many things that I don't want to do it anymore. Right. <laughs> so I was looking at it and then you got the problem with like some of them are self-contained but they're not quite as powerful. And then you have ones that hook up to the computer or console, but then you're stuck wherever that computer and console is. Exactly. I, they're, but, they're getting much better and better, but they're, they're advancing. So like, it really is, if you will, like computers now, it's like, whatever you just bought, there's already a better model out there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Maybe on the price point that met it for you, but you know that in six months, you're going to have new guy envy because they're yep. going to keep improving these various different things. Right. Having said that, VR is that technology that's been the next big thing for what 20 years now. Yeah, yeah. They've been talking about I, I saw my first demonstrations of like um swooping around on a pterodactyl when I was at an early Mac world in like 1990s. Right. You know what I mean? So they've had some of the things, and what they've tried to overcome is all those human factors of you you can't get motion sickness because it doesn't work like your eyes in the real world. Right. You can't have it stutter. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of things that they've had to wait for computer power to catch up, for connectivity to catch up. So it's not, I'm wearing a bath escape helmet for a thing. Oh yeah, I'm not noticing Clunk, that. I can't my move my head. different than real life. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so we, I've been looking into it again because my cousin just got a set. Uh, so, you know, I uh, keeping up with the Joneses there. Um, right. And I found what I think is a good... Um, a balance right now so the oculus quest 2 uh, oculus owned by facebook and they're right. turning facebook into a whole thing so a metaverse that's exactly. something to talk about at some point <laughs> right. but the quest 2 is standalone that has its own store and you can just have the goggles and you're not connected to anything but they have another product called the rift and the rift connects to your computer but it's a whole separate store well i'm looking into it and the quest 2 you can get cables hook it up to your computer and play the Rift games uh, from there when you're hooked to the computer. Plus it's Steam compatible. So I could play Oculus Quest, Rift and Steam games, which had, I think like 40 out of the 41 games I was even semi interested in. So I'm like, Quest okay. 2, that's yeah. probably going to be on our list here. Well, 20 is I'm in a Mensa VR group uh, on Facebook. And I'm, I'm getting continually invited slash prompted by Judy and Emily and Steve to like, come play mini golf with us, come bowl, come explore Toronto, whatever else it might be. And because I haven't bought yet, uh, honestly, what I have is I have the little, remember the Google had cardboard glasses. Yeah, yeah. It was today, but what did they cost? 20 bucks or something right. like that. It was to try it out. That's what I have. They're woefully underpowered for some of these better experiences. And so but I haven't moved up for some of those reasons. I am getting what you just said for the for the Rift or the Oculus, the various different recommendations, you know what I mean, to, to be able to do it. And yet something is stopping me from pulling the trigger. Maybe some part of it is I want to have um, enough money so that if I had to discard one in a year instead of five years, then I'd be willing to do so. But right now, as you know, you and I both laugh about we hold on to our technology longer than most people do who are first uh, mover <laughs> type people. And I, somehow that kicks in for this. My phone is still useful and I'm like four generations behind. I've got a feeling that I would get Oculus Envy if, depending on when I finally buy, depending on what the next version of that is going to be. Because I'm also aware of all those cool yeah. uh, right. graphs well, that are going on that show me computer power going up and how many people are working on cool immersive experiences and what, uh, what game libraries I'll be able to tap into. Right. I just haven't done it yet. Maybe it's not only a matter of just the thing in and of itself. There's all kinds of things that I would like to spend money on besides that and right, throwing right. $200, $300 at that compared to a, a new watch, a new Apple watch. That's kind of going to be my choice. You know what I mean? Right, With a new right, Apple watch, right. I can like monitor my heart rate and my diabetes level. And that's <laughs> kind of cooler than being able to explore Toronto. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So, well, you know, there's always yeah. that price point and features, like you said, uh, and the Quest 2, it's $300. I'm like, uh, that's starting to get into a price range that's, yeah. you know, kind of doable for a new tech. I mean, when I got that's the right. latest Xbox, it was like 450 500 But, right. you know, we've had it five, six years. Plus, the other thing is to keep that, I was like, okay, 
the the quest two ha is basically backwards compatible with the old quest so any games you used to be able to play you can play on the new one and also on the new right? yeah so and i i'm i mean i don't think they're going to have a quest three anytime real soon so I've, I kind of hit that point where it's the features, the cost, uh, you know, yeah. and everything you can do. And everybody in the family wants to get it. And my cousin got it. So, you know, now I'm like, I okay. Yeah. Also, what I'm kind of looking for is, like, it isn't just a matter of new hardware. I want it to be that the hardware is so mighty that they're still tapping into it and improving upon it. And if I could update the device with new software, and that's what gives me yeah. version 2.1, 2.3, et cetera, that gives me that extended life that I'm curious about. When it seems to be that it's kind of frozen as that version, and it doesn't have hardware, uh, software updatability, that makes me distrust it. You know what right, I mean? Right. One of the coolest things about getting any smartphone or any watch is that they're per perpetually putting out new versions and not just it runs faster, but they add, actually add like new features and new right. connectivity and stuff like that. So yeah. I like that situation, I guess. Yep, so yep. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Okay, so uh, holiday season, Mm -hmm. um what's that doing to the investing uh how does that change at the holiday season <laughs> so <laughs> i just had a bad week last week uh -oh. i lost um i hardly ever use numbers i lost tens of thousands of dollars wow i'm in um very much growth very much tech as omicron comes out as christmas shopping is usually not about growth but about christmasy things if you will as the end of the year is often where people that have been investing for the year are taking profits so that they can not worry about it because they're going to go on vacation for two weeks and they don't want to be in the market. They're going to get out of various different things. All those factors combined to punch me in the face last week. This morning, I was up 11K out of the 20K that I lost. And so okay. percentage wise, it, I don't even know that it's like, oh God, it's not a disaster. You know, I'm going to do okay. But just individual stocks for instance have gone down like um docusign was down 42 percent docusign is a fantastic company that's going to change the world over the course of time but whatever was built into the price earnings ratio it really isn't the right thing to use for a growth stock but there's enough people still that say wow that's just getting to be too much of a rarefied atmosphere even though it's profitable even though it's there's a multiplier that says a lot of people are betting too much on future profits instead of now profits. And so of all the stocks to get out of, apparently the DocuSign didn't even have bad financial news. They didn't have the wrong earnings report come out. There was some, sometimes you don't know how wow. ripples run through the fear, uncertainty and doubt that runs through the market. And so today it was, um, or maybe yesterday it was, um, sorry, um, a pharmaceutical company. And again, no deep, bad financial report. That was just the whipping boy that everybody said, I've lost faith in this for a while. And they took, or it could be that they just took profits and maybe they'll get right back in. Some part of why I made money back today was all the people that made their profits. Now they're saying, no, these things are kind of on sale. I want to be in HubSpot. I want to be in Tesla. I want to be in the, the trade desk. I want to be in Spotify. They're getting back in, having let, like maybe they got out at, you know, 40 and it went down to 30. So now it's on sale. So you know what I'm trying to say? There, there's, um, I've, I've been on a bit of a roller coaster ride, but I sold nothing off in a panic. I'm holding on to everything. I have about 100 stocks now between my multiple, multiple portfolios that are all pretty much looking to the future. I'm in for at least five years to get some of these things to pay off. So having said that, I, I you know, what, what are our top stocks? Tesla is still doing really well. Um, if you're worried about any kind of like, um, if you want to be in the Wild West, be looking into all the variations of cryptocurrency. I'm yeah. in both Bitcoin and Ethereum, and I'm, I'm learning a lot about what are the things I might want to be in. And yet that's where those swings of 30%, 40% in a day are common, not startling. And so I just, I don't know, maybe because I feel ill-equipped compared to a lot of people that really know a ton about it. I don't want to be, you know, if, if you're at the table and you can't look around and see who the sap is, it's, you, <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Don't sit down at a table full of sharks when you're a minnow. And so until I learn enough that I'm cocky in how much I know about cryptocurrency and all the various different variations of it, I'm just invested in kind of, 
I've read the stories of these enough and you, you can't, you know, buying Bitcoin is kind of like, I'm into crypto. That's what everybody does to learn yeah. about crypto, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm still heartened by like uh, some stocks that I bought a long time ago because I liked their story. Um, they're now getting more recommended to the mainstream like Twilio. For instance, if you've had uh, to your phone, you'll get little texts that say, hey, um, your dentist appointment is coming up. Please wait in the car in the parking lot so that you don't have you waiting in the office because we don't worry about masks and stuff like that. And all that messaging back and forth about reminding you of your tickets, reminding you of a doctor's appointment, much of that is driven by Twilio. And it really, everybody that's looking at that solution to those problems of, I don't want someone working the phones and calling 500 people. I want to be able to run off of my customer oh, database and then send these things out automatically with my tolerances for three days before, one day before, et cetera. Twilio is behind all of that and they're a well-run company. So if you're looking to say, not only are those messages useful, but the people that are putting those messages out for every company out there, I'd recommend Twilio. There you, <laughs> you go. Know what I mean? that kind of thing. So exactly. <laughs> well, I've, I've got super minor investments compared to what you've got, but they have been up a little bit. So, I mean, I checked it a while back. I was talking to Colin about it, trying to convince him to start looking into it. You, look, dude, you're 21. You're making a lot of money put it into this and retire when you're 45, 50, not 70. Yeah. Um, so I was like, Oh good. I'm up a little bit, but I'm done thinking about it for this day. But my Amazon ads for books, I, over the last three months, I doubled the amount I spent on advertising. So for every dollar I put in advertising, I got $2 in sales. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. I was like, cool. Stuff really, you know, in, in the face of um, scandals in terms of, how many listens you have to have on Spotify to make any kind of money compared to the CEO now being worth $4 billion. Or whatever <laughs> right. like that. It's cool to see that there are some that work. And there was even a list of um, which were the ones that got you the most like reasonable return for the time and the money that you put into putting product out there, putting advertising out there and stuff like that. So Amazon yeah. is working for you, at least in that for, way. Yeah, There's a little bit. I mean, it's still yeah. not thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, yeah. You actually get limited to the amount Amazon will spend sometimes. It's weird. So, okay. okay. Um, but I do have not necessarily a Raspberry Pi update, but a programming yeah. Linux update. So I have been on um, Mint uh, Linux that I told you about, and I, I'm going to have an update next week with something different. But I wanted to... There's a program I mentioned called Twine, which is allowing you to create interactive fiction. And it's actually used in video game companies to create narrative design. I mean, the last Assassin's Creed, they use Twine to create the branching narrative for the game. That's, so that's it, an addiction. Yeah. Last Assassin's Creed is a good game. And if that's what they use. Ex hmm, exactly. Okay. So I've been playing with it. One of the reasons I like Twine compared to some of the others is it will export into just HTML and CSS. So you can put it on your browser. But then what I've been doing is using Cordova, which is an open source project that takes those type of things, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and compiles it into a format that you can install as a mobile uh, program uh, wow. on iOS, yeah. Android, stuff like that. So and, and draw some libraries and make it standalone instead of having to worry about what the environment is that you're yes. installing onto. Got it. Okay. Yes. So I was doing That's this on, <laughs> on Mint Linux, and like a lot of things, Cordova is not just oh I installed it now I have a nice interface. There's commands and I and you have to pull down libraries and yeah. So at some point it's fun for the tech. Oh, how do I get this to work and what's wrong with it now and research and all. It can be fun uh, for the person that's been doing it and a little older with family and other uh, responsibilities, like, oh my God, just freaking work. This is why I use Windows or Mac, you know? <laughs> but anyway, so I played with it and got it working. So I literally sat down and created a really quick uh, little branching interactive narrative on Twine, exported it, put it into Cordova, compiled it, and then put it on my phone. So I have a very short interactive fiction story on my phone that I wrote and got working Isn't so that, there's my, that's amazing magic it is it it's, used to be that you really had to know so many yes. things about compiling a language and what what's your destination your target environment and uh, man how many installers i wrote for ameritech <laughs> that were based on what version of 
windows and other things you had and making sure you had the components so that you'd just be able to open and print a spreadsheet or whatever else it might be. And now they've so idiot proof that they've so smartized. Oh, it. I don't know so if I'd say idiot proofed it. Okay. <laughs> it took a little bit of, I mean, and at least they, it's doing so much for you that yeah. used to be all manual. And wow, good for you. And, and the time, you know, that was two weeks worth of work. You did. And, and, and the thing is, me. all of that is on Windows and Mac. I can run all of it on Windows and Mac. Yeah. And I do, and I have it. And it is a little quicker, easier to get it all running. Uh, it still did take some work. Cordova is not much easier on Windows than it is on Linux. Okay. But I really wanted to do it on Linux just because. You know how that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, when I first started to work with things that were cross-platform, like MetroWorks, it was, I, I spent a lot of time learning how to do it because I knew that this was going to be useful into the future. There will always be multiple platforms. The, the concepts that go into, how do you isolate your I.O.? How do you deal with various different, all, all of your, um, display devices and input devices, you have to know what they're capable of and how to scale up and scale down, either putting it all on the machine and letting it choose or be able to choose for their environment what's most appropriate. Right. And it was kind of fascinating to say, I'm going to overcome all these limitations that might make it break. And actually, it'll run when they install it first time. They'll be happy. They'll be satisfied. And so it was a kind of a cool puzzle. But boy, it was a ton to learn. The amount that I had, we've talked about this long ago about, it isn't only a matter what you have on your computer. Are you at the most current driver? Can you prompt them to install a newer driver so that their video card really does? And man, I had to contend with so much. This is back in my Ameritech consulting days to just make it so that it was um, bulletproof 80% uh, of the time and know that I would still have to go to these and then be able to explain, well, the reason that you didn't work is because you have a too new or a too old version of this. And it could be that we can find the driver and make this better, or you can just requisition a new video card. You'll be happier on your PC and it'll be more compatible with what we're trying to put out for the security that we're doing. <laughs> and so there was a chance to get talk to all kinds of people in a way that I really kind of got to be, I wanted to be knowledgeable. I wanted to be able to say, quickly troubleshooting, here's the flaw and here's why you can't. But you can, if we just fix this one thing, not throw your hands up and say, well, I'll get back to you in a month with a new version. You know what I mean? It, right. it was, it was kind of cool to be able to be that knowledgeable. So and people don't realize how easy and lucky things are with the current OSs and the state of Absolutely. the computer. It's totally different yeah. than 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I probably write a post uh, about that a year that every time that I apply a system software update to any of my devices and it doesn't crash and you know, then it's unavailable to me for two or three days until I read the 12.001 version is available and you got to go to Apple, but you already, you know, it, when the installer got rid of um, the library that the executable used. So now you have to, it used to be such a matter of troubleshooting and pain. And now it just seems to be, it, it does all that for me. Yeah. And, and so I, I it's kind of cool. I'm happy to not have to know. All that <laughs> so, so, you know what I mean? <laughs> so everything pretty much works. It's all good. So I have to go seek out new avenues to create pain and make it difficult. <laughs> That's, you know, well, there's, whatever. Yeah, there's just different problems to solve now. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's <laughs> for enjoyment. I mean, I know it sounds weird, but you know, I know <laughs> Linux is something I can just dig into like I did in the 80s, 90s and, yeah. and really get down and what's the problem and what do I have to code and, you know, and all that. So I just saw, you know, I, memes pop up all the time, various different posts. And someone just posted about where um, I just changed this thing in CSS and like five buildings away on somebody else's screen, something just went wrong <laughs> because there, if you've used CSS at all, it really did have kind of under the hood ripple effect type stuff yeah. that, continually happened even though you were sure that what you were doing was as compatible and as small as you could make it and it was still just all kinds of like well that code fell off into la la land and it didn't even affect me it affected anyway yeah anyway. <laughs> okay so do you have besides uh the beatles get back do you have any music movie or book uh, recommendations this week oh, yes um i have long liked an author named f paul wilson who did the repairman jack books yeah, they're great. They uh, the reason I first got into them, you know, everybody kind of browses and the pull quote was from Stephen King saying one of the best um, summer novels I've ever read and, or the series. If you're not reading the Repairman Jack books, you should be. I like Stephen King. I respect Stephen King. I think I will try them. And then I found out that there's 
like um, he's got a whole world of, of interlocking series about um, these vampires and Repairman Jack and uh, uh, kind of like moving towards the end of the world, Night World. Some things have been made into movies like The Keep. And so I really liked all those books. And he actually brought the Repairman Jack series pretty much to a close. Sob on my part. Just discovered that he has a new series out called Panacea. It's about a universal cure and how the world would pursue that or hide it or kill people about it, et cetera, et cetera. And his, I love his writing style. I love how knowledgeable he is. I love how um, he creates good characters. He often, um, he does a really interesting thing of dropping in and out of like first, second, third person. He'll talk about what you're thinking, what this person is thinking, and then they'll have somebody else that talks about the, what they speculate they're thinking about, but what they really did, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it's, um, they let you kind of play along with, someone just did something, what did the person think of it? What were they thinking when they did it? And it really creates a very interesting tanglement of, uh, this is how things really happen in the real world. When someone tries something tricky and the other person is able to outwit them, they weren't just lucky. They actually said, I know enough about person that that's why they put their car here because they were trying to think that no one would look for it. And so it just, I really enjoy them. And they're a page turner. They really are like, they're a thriller. You got to find out what's going to happen. Wow. Um, so there's three in this series. And already I'm like two thirds of the way for, through the first book. You know, one of those, I love books where it isn't only you're reading it and like the last half hour at night before you go to sleep. It's like, well, I just went to the bathroom, but you know, I could just sit down here on the bed and read about half an hour if I wanted to. And I'm sneaking in time to read more because nice. they're really turning out well. So oh, recommendation for, for the Panacea series by F. Paul Wilson. F. Paul Wilson. Okay, okay. okay, I'll check those out. Okay. Um, I, I don't have a book this week. Uh, it's been a little slow mm -hmm. with everything going on at work and stuff. But uh, since it is Christmas, I pulled out my train Christmas in Tahoe album. And it very okay. quickly became one of my top Christmas albums every year now. Um, if you're going to get it, I'd recommend the Amazon deluxe version, digital version, because okay. they have some Amazon exclusive songs. So it almost doubles the album. So I love it. I, 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 not to be weird, Train is one of those groups like, what happened to them? They were huge for like three, four, five years, and I haven't heard of them for like 10. Yeah. Still putting things out? They're still vital? Uh, um, yes. Um, Colin and I went to a couple concerts and loved it. That's I didn't care for the group as much um, okay. before Good. this, but Colin loved them, so I took them to a concert and totally fell in love with them and devoured them, you know? Um, okay. But then I guess wow. after uh, the the... The one, uh, I forget the name of the album off the top of my head, California 37 maybe, or okay. the, the Golden Gate Bridge album. Uh, the group kind of split apart. Uh, most of the group left to do other things. Pat stayed there. Um, and they started, oh, here's a trivia. Well, I, I didn't think I had trivia for the week. Okay. So I'll throw this in. <laughs> uh, trivia question. Train started out before they were signed as a cover band for what group? So what do I think about their music? How about like Counting Crows or something like that? Oh, that's a good oh. choice. Very similar style. Okay. No, they yeah. originally were a Led Zeppelin cover band. Interesting. So the Greta Van Fleet of their day. Yes, exactly. I will recommend that if you haven't heard of them. They yes, are, Greta they Van are Fleet. They really in a Zeppelin-esque way. So. Yeah. I, I actually, I have Rocksmith for playing guitar and bass uh, on Steam. Yeah. And Greta Van Fleet has like six, seven songs. I've got them all. So how oh, interesting is that that they've released into that environment? If yeah. You will. Okay. Very yeah. cool. Very so much. Train Train released a uh, the, after the group kind of disintegrated a bit. Pat went back with some new guys and recorded Led Zeppelin II, the complete Led Zeppelin II album cover, uh, so, and yeah. then the Christmas in Tahoe. And that's all I've known about them for the last couple of years. Okay. I so um, wow. I, we just saw Kansas and Marietta this last weekend, and it really is, um, uh, it's kind of funny, a guy who I thought was their new main songwriter has left the group, so it was kind of back to being um, really good artists, virtuoso musicians, playing good music, but I kind of thought he had become their new leader, and now he's gone, so I'm not sure whither go Kansas. Wow. Having said that, the reason I wanted to say is, I really miss Steve Walsh on certain songs. They had a, a good vocalist, Danny um I, I can't think of the last name but you know steve had that he had that ability to like crack your voice at the right time that ability to soar at the right time that really was and there's a, he has a solo album called glossolalia 
yeah, which, I, and, and the word means like unable to stop talking, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and I can't tell you, they're great Kansas songs, but with extra crunch, the guys he's got working with him are all from like Dream Theater and other oh, wow. heavier bands, if you will. And I, that's one of those albums that I, I put that on more often than other albums because I never mind hearing it. It's nice. again, it's got like 10, 12 great songs and uh, a couple nice like nine, 10 minute ones like Punching the Clowns. And I don't know, it's just, it's really good and relatively unknown. So get in on Glossolalia by Steve Walsh if you're looking for a dose of great new Kansas without being Kansas. <laughs> nice. Okay, so. <laughs> there you go. And I've been listening to a lot of Trans-Siberian since uh, we went and saw First Snow. There um, we go. So trivia. I failed miserably. I could not think of the planet Silver Surfer was from. I did not look it up. So what's the answer to that one? It's Zen La. Zen La. <laughs> wow, Zen La. I did not and, remember and, that. I kept honestly, thinking it was like a K D R or something or other. No, that's the one that couldn't come to me. I did remember it's like funny. I remember Shalabal, which is his love, that he actually had to like leave her right. so the whole planet could live. So I I don't know. I I just was um I, I won't go into it. I'm happy that I'm not going too much flowers for Algernon where I'm really starting to lose too many things. You know, occasionally when I blip on somebody's name, I've never been good about that. For all that I absorb <laughs> information, I've embarrassed myself too many times with like, I really like you. I know we've talked at an RG before, but without your name tag on, I just suck. I just yeah, suck. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can sit down and write code <laughs> to connect to the database and I can do that without thinking about it. So, yeah. you know, I don't think I'm that bad. Yeah, I've tried the mnemonics of like, you meet someone, you go like, okay, Bill, Bill, Bill. And you try to picture Bill with like, you know, a Buffalo Bill. And I, I've tried all those things. And that somehow things flit away with yeah. things, even though that's such a terrible thing to be bad about. Yeah. Oh, well, I just, it's kind of, it's good to be humbled again and again, because for as much as I can be full of myself, oh, I know all this stuff. Nope, about that. I just, I'm, I'm not, I'm just right. not. Right. <laughs> so next week, we hopefully should have a guest on. Uh, Colin leaves tomorrow to go to C2E2, the Chicago Comic Con toy show. You mentioned that. It'll be a pleasure to hear his yes. take on all the good new Christmas goodies and yes. just everything. That, that'll be great. Okay. Yeah, so it'll be fun finding out about that stuff. So. Very good. Cool, okay. man. Very good. Always a pleasure. We'll see you later. Talk to you later. You have been listening to the Relentless Geekery Podcast. Come back next week and join Alan and Stephen's conversation on Geek Topics of the Week.